before, um, before we introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to take a few minutes just to remember George uh, Van Weiss, who was Jia Chen's uh, PhD advisor at um, University of Southern California. And uh, George tragically um, died of cancer this last year. And originally we had, uh, I believe we had asked and uh, George was so, had scheduled to come and give this seminar uh, before COVID and then was rescheduled to be uh, online. But as I mentioned, he, he succumbed to, to cancer before that as a very young guy. And I didn't know George, uh, but I had followed his work, particularly on uh, the work that uh, Jia Chen is going to tell us about today, the role of, of improving people's lives in the cities uh, by innovative efforts to, um, to work on materials. Uh, that was to reduce the heat load and to reduce um, to reduce ozone, for example, just a, a number of very innovative, he was just clearly a very, very clever uh, person and is a great loss to our community. Um, in addition to his, uh, his science and engineering, George was also a talented mentor and, um, and also a very talented musician. And so uh, I, I just think we could take just a minute of, of quiet time now to, to remember George for those uh, who have read his work and, and thought about it before we introduce our speaker today. Okay, so thanks everyone very much. And Claire, would, would you do the introduction? Uh, I'll do the introduction. Oh, sorry, yes. No, no problem. Uh, I'm very glad that Jia Chen can join us and give us the EIP Center Day. So Jia Chen did her undergrad in Penn University. That's also how we know each other. Uh, so we have been knowing each other for almost <laughs> 10 years, doing the same group back then. And after that, she joined the uh, University of Southern California and got her PhD here, there, uh, working with George, as we already know. So her PhD work focused on the interaction between air pollution and climate change, and also different measures to mitigate uh, the uh, in cities. And after getting her PhD in 2019, she joined uh, California Air Resources Board, and now she's an air resource engineer there, continues her work on um, different measures on uh, uh, mitigating climate change and uh, air pollution. So starting from this semester, she's also a part-time lecturer at the uh, University of Southern California, teaching a course called Air Pollution Fundamentals. And today we'll hear some, about some of her work on the uh, engineering methods in cities uh, for mitigating and adapting climate change. With that, please take it away. Thank you, Zhao Yi. Thank you, Paul and Claire and your and thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate how thoughtful you were. And um, I really want to take this as, as an opportunity to continue George's legacy and by sharing his work with you. And, you know, I think Paul already well said like George's achievements, um, but he's really, he was really the most amazing person I've ever known in my life. Yeah, oh. Like oh, thank you so much for letting me know this. Yep. Um, so he's a professor by day and a professional bass player by night, as well as a very caring and dedicated advisor at that. So um, I really think that his life is very inspiring and I'd love to share more, more with you about our memories and our re research in this presentation. Um, I would also briefly talk about my work at CARB, the California Air Resources Board. I hope that may be of your interest as well. Um, so because I have a lot of materials to cover, so I do hope uh, or I'd appreciate it if we can save all the questions till the end. And I'm also happy to discuss after this webinar uh, in person as well. So thank you very much for having me. It's really exciting to present it in person after two years. <laughs> okay, so let's start from the motivation of all our research. Is there a way that I can remove this? Or... Oh, 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so the motivation of all our research is the changing climate. So let me also pull up the pointer. Okay, here we go. Hope those folks online can also see this. So, okay, awesome. Yeah, so um, by the end of the century, even if we substantially reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, we will still have around two degrees Celsius temperature increase as compared to pre-industrial level. And this will cause uh, adverse impacts around the globe and different regions are facing uh, you know, slightly different problems. Here in the West, we're gonna experience more e extreme heat events and as well as droughts or wildfires, etc. And this really prompts us to ask, what can we do? What engineering methods and policy measures can we use to mitigate and help people adapt to climate change? So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Let's see why it's not working. Okay, great. So for mitigation strategy, uh, we're really gonna look at how reducing black carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions uh, can help mitigating uh, the future climate change. And for adaptation, we are specifically focused on cities and how citizens can uh, adapt to climate change with solar reflective pool roofs and walls. So when I think about climate change mitigation or adaptation strategies, I think about how we can reduce global or local air temperatures. Um, and I'll go back to uh, this figure of the relative balance of Earth atmosphere system. Um, so in our work, we specifically look at uh, how we can alter temperatures by alter the energy balance by reducing the absorption of solar radiation, either by increasing the Earth's surface um, reflectance or by reducing light absorbing aerosols in the atmosphere. Or we can reduce um, the absorption of long wave radiation by reducing carbon dioxide emissions, especially from the major contributors, the energy and transportation sectors. And we should also note that um, the climate uh, is interacting with all these different aspects like air quality, land cover, and different sectors in our society. It's impacting all of this and is also impacted by all of this. So when we look at climate change adaptation or mitigation strategies, we also need to uh, look at its impacts on other uh, aspects of uh, our society, like air quality, and also make sure that people can still live a comfortable life. So there's a need for researching synergistic sustainable solutions and to look at the co-benefits as well as penalties of climate change mitigation adaptation strategies. So in today's presentation, uh, I'm gonna focus on adopting solar reflective cool surfaces in urban areas as a way to adapt to future climate change and reduce urban heat. I will also very briefly talk about our efforts in uh, light absorbing uh, aerosols, like carbon aerosols in the atmosphere and uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the energy and transportation sectors. So for this first topic, I'm gonna discuss the effectiveness of, um, re uh, of adopting solar reflective surfaces in reducing urban air temperatures uh, which can be used as a climate change adaptation strategy, as well as co-benefits and penalties in air quality, which has implications in health and environmental justice, and its possible impacts on global climate, whether it can be used as a climate change adaptation strategy. So we particularly investigated how adopting solar reflective surfaces can change um, the climate uh, in Southern California, not only because we live here, but also because uh, climate change is projected to increase the extreme heat days uh, in Southern California uh, by a time uh, of uh, by a factor of two or three. And if you look at this figure for a city like Compton, even though uh, the increase is just uh, maybe two days, uh, however, people in Compton may, may be less prepared for the change and they may not have air conditioners in, um, installed in their home or they may find it hard to afford the high electricity bills due to increasing temperatures. Um, and on top of the future uh, global temperature rises due to climate change, cities by nature, they're hotter than surrounding rural areas due to the urban heat island effect. Uh, which is mainly contributed, um, can be attributed to uh, different land cover in urban areas versus rural areas. 
So cities have more dark surfaces like asphalt uh, and thermally massive materials, the building materials and lack of vegetation, more anthropogenic heating and the geometry of urban canyons, um, uh, which means uh, the, uh, the space between buildings and above streets also traps radiation in cities. So the combination of global climate change and the urban heat island effect really poses severe heat related challenges for city dwellers, increasing increases in heat stroke and heat exhaustion rates, increases in summertime peak energy and wa water use. Um, so what can we do to mitigate urban heat and help citizens adapt to future climate change? One economic solution is solar reflective cool surfaces. So these surfaces can be used to save energy and reduce air temperatures. Um, the reason for that is that they have a relatively high albedo, meaning that they, they reflect more solar radiation back to space. So the tr traditional like dark, very dark roof can have a beetle of 0 0.05, meaning that it only reflects 5% of the incident solar radiation back to space. A very wide roof can have a, you know, a, a beetle of 0.9, meaning that it can reflect 90% of the radiation back to space. So the simplest way of making a cool roof uh, is just to paint your roof white. And just like you feel cooler with white clothing, the roofs will feel cooler and then cool the climate above and the building below. And here are more examples for cool roofs and pavements. The city of LA has already been promoting the adoption of cool roofs. Um, and for those of you who own or want to buy a property in LA, uh, the, the, the city council passed a law that requires all new or refurbished homes to have solar reflective cool roofs. And just on a side note, a uh, cool roof doesn't have to be white. So I can see that here you have more options if you don't like your roof to be white. So these materials, they're reflective, um, not at the visible spectrum, but uh, at the, uh, they re reflect more near infrared sunlight. So despite that cool walls, uh, cool roofs have been already, uh, you know, sort of widely promoted, uh, and cool payments, there are su some studies studied it, but um, cool walls were, you know, were really um, not well studied. And the way walls interacted with radiation can be very different from roofs because walls are vertical surfaces. So we thought that was a missed opportunity. So that's why we work on, on this project in collaboration with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, on the, um, on the uh, benefits, technologies, and implementation of solar reflective cool walls. So part of this project um, is a, a natural exposure trial. Uh, and here you can see some racks um, that we, uh, uh, so we have three racks that we placed uh, at USC. And on these racks, there are different cool wall specimens. So again, um, you know, it doesn't have to be white. And uh, so we, uh, through this natural exposure trial plus lab testing, we were able to measure the change in wall albedo over two years. So, so that's the testing for different technologies, different types of uh, wall material, how their albedo uh, degrade. And at USC, we were responsible uh, and we led the climate and air quality modeling portion of it to better understand the effectiveness and co-benefits or penalties of um, cool uh, walls. So this is what we did. So we first quantified the climate effects of cool walls in Los Angeles. Uh, we look at the change in energy budget, air temperatures in summer, uh, and we compare the climate effects of adopting cool walls to cool roofs. Uh, this is the first systematic comparison between these two. And we also investigated the influences of cool walls and roofs on air quality. Um, so particularly there was a you know, lack of research on their influence on PM 2.5. So uh, we uh, estimated the influence uh, on different PM 2.5 species and tried to associate them with different mechanisms. So we used WARF and WARFCAM and our innermost domain covered uh, Southern California. So here are some results. Okay, so yeah. So here we are looking at the grid cell albedo for uh, uh, Southern California, and you may find Caltech on this map. <laughs> um, so the grid cell albedo uh, is pretty much like a bird's view. Like if you view it from the sky, uh, how the radiative fluxes can be all, all, all altered due to adopting cool walls. Um, 
And the gray star albedo increases from cool hours the largest in the early morning and actually the late afternoon, although it's not shown here, then at noon. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that's when the, the walls see most of the sunlight. And as the sun rises up, you know, the walls can barely see incident sunlight. So, okay, so then we took a look at the daytime cumulative increases in reflected solar radiation induced by cool walls versus roofs. And we found that the daytime cumulative increase um, induced by uh, uh, cool walls is about 43% of that induced by cool roofs. And here are the factors that contributed to this difference. Um, so first, solar irradiance on walls uh, is about 40% of that on roofs in July uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and that's related to solar angle. And wall area is about a factor of two greater than roof area in Los Angeles. And walls can be shaded. Well, in our model, we, we don't consider that you know, roofs um, are not shade, are shaded. Uh, and the solar radiation that's reflected by walls is partially absorbed by opposing walls and pavements, but that re re reflected by roofs escapes from um, the canopy. So that's uh, so, so. So the fraction of solar radiation reflected by walls absorbed by uh, opposing walls and pavements affected by uh, urban geometry, like the building height or the canyon width. So all of these factors can be different for different cities. So these are the things to consider when city um, like decision makers want to adopt cool walls versus roofs for payments. So then we look at the impacts on canyon air temperatures. Uh, so we implement the prioritization to describe uh, to, to diagnose the, the air temperature that pedestrians feel when they are walk uh, on the street. Uh, and we can see that cool walls lead to temperature reductions um, you know, throughout the day uh, with similar uh, chain, uh, reductions at 2 p.m., 8 p.m. And you can see more reductions in inland areas as compared to coastal areas as uh, sea breeze backs air from uh, the, the coast to from the west to the east. There's um, uh, accumulation effect of temperature reduction. And here's the diurnal cycle of temperature changes uh, for different scenarios. Uh, so if you look at the solid lines here, this represents the scenario where we uh, adopt uh, very high reflective walls or very, uh, very, very reflective roofs. Um, and you can see that cool walls lead to less cooling than cool roofs for most daytime hours, or more cooling during nighttime hours. And the shape of the diurnal cycle can be attributed to uh, different factors, including increases in uh, reflected solar radiation, which differs uh, by, you know, if it's wall or roof, and uh, the mixing height um, can also uh, affect uh, how the sensible heat flux uh, can affect the temperature change within the, uh, the planetary boundary layer uh, and the accumulation of solar heat gain. So I think the major, one of the takeaways of this study is that uh, when we look at the daily mean canyon air temperature reductions, uh, this, these are similar for cool walls versus roofs. Um, and this really inspired uh, the U.S. Green Building Council to give credits for cool walls uh, for the, um, the lead pilot credit. So now, what are the air quality effects of adopting cool surfaces? As you all know, climate and air quality interact with each other. So with a reduction in temperature in LA, there would be a reduction in wind speed and mixing height. And as a result, there will be uh, less ventilation and dry deposition of pollutants, leading to increases in ozone and PM. But for ozone, another very important mechanism is um, that the reduction in temperatures will slow down temperature-dependent reactions and emissions. For PM, it's more complicated because there are these temperature-dependent reactions and also uh, gas-to-particle conversion uh, for semi-volatile PM. So this, uh, with these competing effects, uh, it's, it was our intent to use uh, WorfCam to simulate the overall outcome of all these different mechanisms. So here are the results. So first, for ozone, we found that uh, increasing wall or roof albedo lead to uh, uh, eight hour daily maximum, uh, uh, eight hour average daily maximum ozone reductions of uh, 0.26 ppbv or 
83 PV. So these are the scenarios we will adopt very, very high reflective roofs over walls uh, in the basin. And this reduction in ozone concentration can be attributed to the, the um, decrease in temperature dependent photochemical reaction rates. However, we found that cool roofs and walls slightly increase, increase daily average PM2.5 concentrations. Um, uh, again, with a larger change induced by roofs versus walls. So why is that? So we look at physiochemical uh, processes that uh, can potentially drive the changes in the concentration of different PM species. So as I mentioned before, there are three pathways, uh, reducing uh, ventilation, slowing down temperature dependent reactions and emissions and increasing gas to particle um, uh, conversion for semi-volatile species. So we use CO as a tracer to separate the effect of ventilation versus other effects. Um, and uh, the solid line here uh, shows the overall change and the dashed line here shows the change without the ventilation effect. So we found is that for a primary um, uh, uh, species uh, BC, a prime fluid in BC, um, the change is mainly induced by uh, ventilation. But then for nitrate, which is a semi-volatile species, uh, the change is mainly uh, um, induced by factors other than ventilation, which we think uh, is the increase uh, in gas to particle uh, conversion for nitrate. So. The takeaway of this study is that for policymakers, it's important to assess heat mitigation impacts, not just from a climate perspective, but also from an air quality perspective. So in this case, um, they can reduce ozone while slightly increase PM2.5 concentrations. So there are really many other co-benefits or risks that we should uh, further study. Uh, for example, there are co-benefits on public health and environmental equity, especially their impacts on disadvantaged communities or vulnerable communities. And there are also other heat mitigation strategies like vegetative roofs or street level vegetation that are worth more uh, uh, investigation. And I think in the long term, uh, it'd be very helpful if we could develop a framework to evaluate the cost effectiveness of heat mitigation strategies, which can be used to assess which or which uh, um, combination of strategies could work best for different cities. And I think such framework should consider not just the climate impact, but also air quality, or the change in the albedo, thermal comfort, environmental justice, energy consumption, and of course, cost. I think by now uh, it's clear that cool roofs can be used as a climate change mitigation strategy and help reduce city heat. Um, but the next question is, uh, can adopting cool surfaces reduce temperatures at larger scales? and help mitigate climate change globally. So it's challenging to quantify the global climate impacts of cool roofs. So there are two ways. Uh, the first way is to uh, estimate its related forcing, the related benefits of adopting um, uh, cool surfaces by looking at the change in uh, outgoing reflected solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And another way is to uh, estimate uh, There were only a, a few studies on this, and they disagreed on the global climate impact of cool roofs, with four studies suggesting the cooling effect, and one study suggesting a warming effect. And uh, this study is the only one that used a sophisticated or system model, and they hypothesized that the warming is due to uh, polar cloud feedback and absorption of uh, reflected radiation by black carbon aerosols. So it was our intent to um, uh, again, you know, revisit this topic using an Earth system model and uh, add to that debate and uh, resolve uh, the discrepancies among different studies. So we used the community Earth system model to statistically quantify the impact of cool roofs on regional and global scale climate. Uh, so we conducted uh, uh, three ensemble simulations um, for two scenarios. Uh, one is the uh, dark scenario where roof albedo is at 2.15, and the cool scenario where roof albedo is at 2.9. So this is really to, to quantify the upper bound effect. And we look at the changes in 
temperature, radiative fluxes, the influences of aerosols and clouds on the radiative benefits to respond to uh, previous papers. And um, here's the, um, just to give you a, a you know, idea of the urban fraction across the globe. Um, and this, this urban uh, fraction, uh, when we alter the albedo of roofs can lead to grid cell albedo change. Uh, with greater changes in India, China, Europe, and parts of the US. So that's where we focus our regional analysis on. Okay, so for our regional analysis, we first look at the changes in uh, reflected solar radiation. Um, so here on, on these four uh, panels, um, each dot represents one grid cell in each re region shown here. So we have four regions, four colors. Uh, so, uh, so I will just walk you through these four panels one by one. So when you look at the upper left panel, uh, this shows the relationship between grid cell albedo change versus uh, the upward shortwave flux at the surface. So when you have a higher albedo, then of course you have a higher uh, shortwave flux at the surface. Uh, and this is a linear for each region and slope sort of re re represents the incident sunlight at different regions. And then uh, this plot here shows that uh, if there's no cloud, uh, the relationship between reflected solar radiation at the surface versus the reflected solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere uh, is you know, pretty linear. Um, but then uh, when there is clouds, then the relationship uh, you know, gets more messy, uh, means that you know, clouds feedback can partially offside or even reverse uh, the radiative benefits of cool roofs. And the last panel here shows the aerosol, the changing aerosol forcing for different regions. Um, and um, you can see that uh, the slope for different regions ranges from uh, minus 0.16 for more polluted China to minus 0.04 for cleaner the US meaning that you know, the more polluted an area is, um, the related benefits can be more offset by aerosols. So, uh, so this basically shows that cool roofs can increase solar radiation leaving the Earth's atmosphere system, although aerosols and clouds partially offset the related benefits. And we also look at the changes in uh, regional air temperatures. And we found that cool roofs can reduce uh, the regional air, average air temperatures in the US and China, uh, while its results on um, India and Europe are uncertain. And finally, we analyzed uh, the impacts of cool roofs on global scale, on the energy fluxes and temperatures. Um, and we found that most of these variables, they don't have a really significant signal uh, due to adopting cool surfaces. And for what we care the most, the surface air temperature, uh, there's a reduction of 0 0.002 Kelvin, but uncertainty is 0 0.026 uh, Kelvin. So if we compare our results with uh, the previous study on global average air temperature, we found that uh, you know, the, we're, we're concluding that it's not really like cooling the climate or warming the climate, but it's statistically insignificant and likely negligible as compared to natural variability. So the conclusion of this study is that while cool roofs are an effective tool for reducing urban and regional air temperatures, their influence on climate is likely negligible. So in the long term, we still need to think about other ways that can mitigate the global climate change. And this comes to the other two topics that I will uh, go over, quickly go over. So um, the first one is uh, reducing lead absorbing black carbon aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and the second one is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the energy and transportation sectors and how they can serve as a climate change mitigation strategy and what I've learned from that. So for black carbon aerosols, uh, they are produced from incomplete combustion. They are light absorbing and unlike most aerosols like sulfate, they can actually absorb solar radiation and warm the climate. Uh, they're also very important from the health perspective, um, but there's uncertainty, a uh, very uncertainty in black carbon's climate impacts, as well as its vertical distribution, especially in remote re regions. Uh, and 
Uh, one important uh, reason for that uh, is the black carbon's removal processes in chemical transport models um, differ a lot by models, and there's uncertainty regarding that aspect. Uh, and uh, the aging rate of black carbon, so black carbon, they're emitted mostly uh, externally mixed, and then in the atmosphere, they're coated by other soluble, uh, soluble species, which enable them to uptake water and then you know, from cloud and be removed from with precipitation. So that's an important process um, that actually affects the removal of black carbon. Um, so in our study, uh, we optimized the aging rate of black carbon using aircraft observations over the Pacific Ocean uh, and found that aging rates uh, vary by region and season. And to inform collaborative efforts in reducing black carbon emissions, we also calculate the lifetime of black carbon emitted from different regions and to attribute um, uh, black carbon loadings in the atmosphere to um, different sources. Um, so what we found is that black carbon emitted by different regions have distinct lifetime, which suggests that by comparing, by directly comparing the emissions from different regions, um, cannot you know uh, be a good way to uh, to to predict their uh, contribution to atmospheric black carbon and the climate consequences. Um, and we also uh, calculated the regional contribution uh, across uh, different regions. Um, so here each color represents one region. And the takeaway is that for most re regions, uh, the uh, most significant source is its local source. So controlling its local source will be the most effective way in reducing black carbon over this region. And uh, in our group, I mean, George's group, uh, we also had colleagues working on measuring the optical properties of black carbon and to study that from the measurement perspective. So very quick overview of our work on black carbon. Uh, and uh, we know that, you know, black carbon and docking cool roofs, they all alter, I mean, they both alter solar ra ra radiation as a way to reduce temperature. But in the long term, we still need large scale reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, and I, I personally think this is the only way of mitigating global climate change in the long term. So as you can see here uh, in the US, the major contributors of greenhouse gas uh, emissions are from the transportation and electricity production sectors. Uh, and the US has already pledged to slash greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. So with this national goal in mind, what can a city or state do to speed up reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And how will this benefit its local communities? So uh, at USC, we conducted research that informed policies of the city of Los Angeles. So that's the first study I'm gonna talk about next. And at CARB, I'm also uh, involved in uh, you know, using my research to inform the policy ma making for the transportation sector. So that's the second study I will uh, talk about briefly. Um, so I really think that all these policies that we are adopting in the city of LA and California has the potential of being adopted elsewhere and will uh, impact the nationwide policy and the world's policies. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about our so-called LA 100 study first. <laughs> Um, so this is a project that we did at USC in collaboration with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to analyze uh, the impacts of different pathways towards 100% renewable energy uh, and with the push of electrification in different sectors like building, transportation, and the port of LA. So um, we took the modeling output from NREAL their power capacity modeling and energy demand modeling to develop emissions inventory uh, for different LA100 scenarios and then simulate uh, the air quality impacts uh, and as well as its impacts on health. So for emission reductions, uh, we found that for, uh, so this is the control, uh, the, the bar on the left is the control scenario and these are different LA100 100 scenarios. So we found that um, there's reductions in NOx and PM2.5 for all the scenarios, and the transportation sector is the largest contributor to NOx and primary PM2.5 reductions in uh, the city of LA. And the reductions in NOx emissions uh, will lead to 
uh, increases in ozone concentrations um, due to the nonlinearity of ozone chemistry for in most parts of the city of LA. Uh, but it will also lead to reductions in um, daily average PM2.5 concentrations. Fortunately, when we converted the change uh, from um, uh, from ozone and PM to uh, the, you know, the, its health impacts, uh, we found that uh, it would still avoid uh, you know, deaths of 150, which uh, our collaborators at Enroll translated that into um, $1.4 billion in monetized benefits in uh, 2045. So the results are summarized in this technical report. We're also working on a, a manuscript that will be submitted to peer reviewed journals. Um, and the outcome of this study is that um, the city of LA used this study as a guide um, to plan for its uh, renewable energy adoption as well as uh, its pushes for electrification. So I think from this study, I really learned that the transportation sector is a very important source, you know, if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or uh, to reduce our uh, criteria air pollutant emissions. So that's why I went to the California Air Resources Board to further study the emissions from the transportation sector. So just to summarize my presentation today, uh, talk about uh, the work that we did, um, climate change adaptation strategy, how we use uh, the you know, solar reflective surfaces to adapt to climate change and uh, the potential of reducing black carbon aerosols and uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, in different areas. So lastly, I just want to again highlight um, the interactions between these boxes. And I think um, this really makes it a very interesting research topic and also uh, ask policymakers to be more cautious about uh, the outcome that we will uh, get uh, when we adopt a certain policy. So for example, for zero emission vehicles, we also need to make sure that people in disadvantaged communities can also afford electric cars and to provide incentives to them. So climate change is really affecting all the sectors of our society and it's at the same time affected by all of them. So I do think that as scientists and engineers, it's our responsibility to look for synergistic, sustainable solutions that hopefully can solve not only one issue, but many other issues or challenges that our society is facing. So uh, in the end, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, um, Yun and Arash from USC, uh, Tai from PNL, Ronan Haley, Hugo, Sharon Xiaochen, Pablo from LBNL, Junfu and Wei from Peak University, Garvin and Vakram from Enroll, SCQMD for providing us the emissions uh, inventory by source, uh, CARB, uh, my colleagues at CARB and CEC uh, funding sources, and of course, my PhD and postdoc advisor, Professor George Brownweiss, and my colleagues and guidance committees at USC. So with that, um, this is my uh, contact information. If you have any questions, you can um, always contact me and I'm happy to chat more about it. And I would love to hear what you think could be solutions for our future. Thank you so much.